your tears, your exaggeration, your emotions are not going to help your husband. What were the reasons that made you drift apart? Regrets of getting married to this specific person. Falling out of love is not an excuse or a means for divorce. What if the reason for, quote unquote, falling out of love because of abuse? Struggle with miscarriages that struggle with infertility. What are your views and thoughts on gentle parenting? Tired moms are the ones who should be focused on in the churches, supported by the churches. What can husbands do? Unfortunately, in some cases, parents like kind of go out of their way and physically like abuse, God forbid, or do things that they regret later. We get together, we kind of go through the facts and we help them recognize both parties that there is actually emotional abuse happening in this marriage. Establish a counseling ministry in your church. Today, we are excited to have Katie Kolochuk with us. Katie, thank you for coming. It's been a while of scheduling back and forth, but welcome to Spitting Seeds. Thank you. I'm excited. It, yes, it took us a little bit to align our schedules, but what an opportunity. I really appreciate what you do with Spitting Seeds and just great platform to encourage people to give them tools and uh, resources to thank just you. be better. Thank you. For the few people that may not know who Katie is... Can you tell us a little bit who you are, what do you do, where you come from? Yeah. So Katie Kovalchuk, I uh, come from Kent, (laughs) from the hood. (laughs) Um, We are part of Living Hope Church, my family, my husband and I. uh, Pastor Sergi is one of the pastors at Living Hope Church. um, And we have two kids. Sophia is nine and Melanie is 12. And we have a dog now. This is our like six months into our puppy. And we have this awesome privilege and opportunity to be part of our biblical counseling ministry at Living Hope Church, which we call Hope Link. And so my husband and I are one of the biblical counselors there. Um, what we do is marriage counseling together. And then I do women's counseling, adolescent counseling on my own. And just super excited. Like our church is four years young and this ministry is about four years young as well. We started it back in Minnesota. So a little thing for your listeners. Uh, we uh, are here in Washington for three years now since moving back from Minnesota where uh, my husband did seminary school. I did grad school. And yeah, that was a really cool experience. We lived there for three years and uh, Living Hope Church launched. We came back and now in full swing at Living Hope Church and loving it. Thank you. Hopeling has been a huge blessing to the church, to the people of the church, and even people that are outside of Living Hope Church. So thank you for taking this upon yourself, having the pas- a passion and sacrificing so much of your time and your life for it. You deal with marriage counseling and couples. And I want to start off with, for marriages and couples, talk about husbands and wives, and this conversation to be will be more focused on wives. So last episode we recorded was heavily focused on the husbands. Today, we want to focus more on the women. But for those families, those women that are in marriages, that are difficult, that maybe the hope is lost, and they feel like, what's the point of this? Maybe there's regrets of getting married, regrets of getting married to this specific person. What words would you have for them? Well, I just want to say, if they seek biblical counseling, what a great hope we have in the word of God. Like Mm -hmm. the fact that um, they, if these couples choose to taste and see what biblical counseling can bring versus secular psychology, where they would, the source would be themselves, right? And so what kind of hope can you find in yourself if you were to reach within yourself or to find the means to put together a marriage that's been broken and that's been decaying over the years? But if you bring the word of God in, and our God who is able and capable to restore the impossible, then we bring in this hope factor that just like is contagious to either one or both of the spouses. And then it's the driving force behind it because it's no longer the self that's the source of change. It's now the God. And our God is so powerful. And I can witness to that in my measly three years of counseling. We've uh, touched many couples. Some of them were came to us and they were on the the verge of divorce, basically. Like the wife is looking for an apartment to live because she's done or other couples where they're like, hey, we're in it together just for the kids. And then as soon as they're out, we're done. We're doing our own separate lives. And you bring in the word of God and you kind of turn their faces back in the pursuit of Christ. And they put off the old self and Christ renews. And then they start reconnecting and we start seeing. It's not in the sessions that we see this. It's in between sessions through our spiritual warfare and prayer for them. And as they seek God and turn to his word, like, 
he softens. He, this new self, this self-sacrificing, uh, unconditional loving, no longer contractual loving self is put into this marriage. And then those marriages mend. And now a lot of these couples that came to see us a year or two ago are serving in our church. They're together. They're loving it. They have more kids. They're, they're happy couples. So there is hope if you bring Christ into the picture and if you function solely on the word of God as the source. If someone that's listening is in that place of hopelessness, hopelessness on the verge of uh, divorce, maybe living separately, but mentally checked out of their marriage, what can they do, let's say, before even seeing biblical counselor or anybody else, if you were to give them some tools to reignite any sort of hope, what can they do to start? Yeah, a lot of couples get excited to work on their marriage, to work on their relationship. But I would say that's the third, fourth step. I think if these couples first examine themselves, biblically look at the plank in their own eyes, realign their spiritual walk and their pursuit of Christ, and really just like give it a try. Take the challenge for the next three weeks, attend church, get plugged in into a church family, start reading the word of God again with like a hunger and a desire and then pray for it in full faith. Um, you, there's definitely going to be degrees of change and God will put the right people in their lives that can motivate and encourage them. And the word of God will start kindling a fire that's going to turn them to love their spouse and to sacrifice and be patient with their spouse. Marriage is very much a sanctifying tool. And we think, you know, we're fixing marriages, but we're actually turning souls back to Christ and back to salvation. When a couple comes to you for counseling, what are some prerequisites they have to agree on that they will do in between sessions? What do you require of them? Yeah, so when a couple comes to marriage counseling, we evaluate and we do something called like the intake session where we gather all the information. Sometimes it's one or two sessions. And then we decide with my husband, Sergi, whether we're going to work separately or together. Like if the couple is spiritually strong and they're pursuing the Lord and they just have certain things that need to be worked out in the marriage, then we're going to take it as a couple's counseling. But if we see that there's something wrong with the vertical relationship first, then we're going to separate them and work on uh, their a spiritual journey first, but definitely the tools or the commitments that we require is that they first of all commit to counseling. That's number one. Number two is that they commit to doing the homework in between. And our homework is really just getting into God's word, doing some reflective, either self-examining or examining their marriage, seeing what are the underlying reasons why certain things are off the way that they are. And then just joining the church family. Like we very much believe at HopeLink that it has to be a church-based counseling. That's why we take our regular attendees and members only because we want to see them in our life groups. We want to see them at prayer. We want to see them engage with our leaders who are so focused on just truly genuinely caring for them. And I think that's the full meal deal. So we do require our couples to attend prayer room on Wednesday. Our church does a, a gathering at our church office where for a couple hours we worship and we just pray together and it's spirit, spirit filled. And we require them to just attend services on Sunday. And that's also very healing or it's always something like whatever we talk about in our counseling sessions, God works that way. He either brings up that same scripture on the Sunday sermon or that same topic. And so it's like edifying. It's encouraging. They feel like God is leading them and he's confirming to them that he's taking them on this journey, giving them those droplets of hope. So those are some of the things that we do. You mentioned a lot of, let's say when they come and say, okay, let's get you <laughs> straight spiritually. You make sure your, your relationship with God is right. Do you have any pushback? Let's say, a couple comes and they're like, oh, we have this problem we are fighting about, for example, finances and the in-laws. And you're like, well, let's make sure you're good spiritually. Is there pushback? Like, no, no, we're, we're fine there. Like, don't worry about there. We go to church sometimes. We, we're fine there. She's just annoying with this area of my life. He pisses me off with, with that area of my life. Why so much mm -hmm. emphasis on, on the spiritual life rather than fixing what the, the problem is, needs. yeah, the yeah. immediate needs. Yeah, I think we all, not just couples, but even like women that I see, we all want that on and off button, that quick fix, something that will give us like the immediate release from the pain or the immediate fix to give us the high and to get back on the, you know, right plane. But those things are temporary. And we explain that right off the bat when we see them in the intake session. Like if you want permanent change, then it has to come from the heart, right? Out of the heart, the Bible says, come what we feel, what we speak, what we do. And so giving them that understanding and then also feeling out like how hungry are they for permanent change? Are they there, there in the session for selfish reasons? 
then maybe we can feel that and see that as biblical counselors. And maybe it's not the right timing for them. Maybe we send them to a growth group, which Living Hope Church has growth groups where, you know, in a community, the study uh, we gather and they study the word of God or um, prayer room or life group. And then there's a time when God will spur them to that hunger and desire and they can come back for counseling. But definitely just explaining that to them. And most of the time people understand that. And also asking them for patience. We always say like, it took so many years for some of these problems to happen and develop. Like it's going to take us some time. And one of our commitments is like honesty and patience with the process. And so if we get those commitments up front, all we ask sometimes is like, take it in increments. For example, if you're coming in for a marriage problem and we do choose to separate, hey, hang in with us for the next four weeks and let's see what happens. If you don't see change, that's fine. At any point, you can walk away from counseling. But at the same time, and if in those four weeks, there's some major changes, and usually there is because as they're working on themselves, everything else starts aligning and, and coming back into place and there's reconciliation in their relationship, etc. It's exciting for them and they get to hang around longer. And then I always say every counseling relationship depends on the counselee, the person that you're meeting with, on their hunger and on their commitment. How much work are they putting out or willing to put out in the between sessions, right? Because that's where all the change happens. How hungry are they to pursue God and how hard do they want to work? How badly do they want it? How much they want to sweat and sacrifice for it? That's the best counselees with the greatest, fastest outcomes. I don't know if I remember, right? I think you mentioned you mentioned it before that sometimes you require the couple to read the Bible out loud together and pray out loud before sleep. Let's say each spouse takes a turn to pray out loud before sleep. Is that, do I remember that accurately? Yeah, similar to what we were talking about uh, a couple months ago. But I think that's so much missing in just our, our marriages and our relationships these days, right? We're so busy. We know, and it's, it's almost like an awkward thing in our families. And so me and Sergi, we try to kind of push this initiative into our church family at Living Hope Church that this becomes a culture where it's like normal to just have uh, Bible rich conversations just throughout the day. It's normal to have prayer out loud as a family, not just for meals, but in general, like, Hey, you're feeling down. I'm going to pray for you right now here in this living room. And so we encourage couples to start practicing that. And at first it may be an awkward thing, but what a powerful thing. Like what is greater to talk about the episode we watched yesterday or nag about the boss and the situation at work or like how much more fulfilling and rich is it for our mind and our heart to just like sit down with your husband and chat about not even read the Bible out loud. Maybe you have you can, you know, read it on your own time based on your schedule or watching the kids and going to work. But then you come together and you're like discussing James and some of the practical things that you can apply to your marriage. It's fulfilling. It's enriching, but it's so missing in our families these days. And so we encourage that. Okay. Ask those deep questions. Pray for one another. Absolutely. I'm just thinking if a husband and a wife, whatever beef they may have, whatever fights they may have, but if in the evening you come together and you read the Bible and you pray out loud together, I feel like that that will take care of a lot of problems and annoyance, annoyances. Yeah, no, it totally melts away the wall, right? Mm -hmm. I can speak from my personal experiences. There's so many times where I was distant or angry. I was angry and Sergi would come and hold my hands with my stiff body and just pray over me. And as much as I didn't want it and I resisted it in that moment, that opportunity to reconcile because I'm never the first one to ask for forgiveness, but he would pray over me and I would just feel my heart physically melting and opening to him. And then you can have that conversation, right? Because mm -hmm. all those emotions flood away, then you're just like there because you know your husband's praying for you. And so for the husbands, like there's so much power to an isolating wife to pray over her, to open her up to discussion, to communication, to forgiveness, to reconciliation. A lot of things kind of lead back to, to the Bible, to God, reconciling your relationship with Jesus before even with your spouse. Is that the main difference between or what are the differences between biblical counseling and what we nowadays very popular, just secular talk therapy? What are the major main differences between these two? Yeah, I think we kind of touched on it a little bit when we began, but really it's the source Biblical counseling is just that. It's counsel or advice that's Bible-based. So our source is the primary source, which is the Word of God, the Bible. Like we take passages and scriptures and we find the ones that apply to the problem and that individual problems, I should say, because there's always layers of problems. And then we both immerse and digest and meditate on that passage. And it always does something incredible that no secular 
talk therapy or any kind of techniques or any kind of advice from books can do. The word of God penetrates the heart, right? Hebrews mm -hmm. 4.12, the intentions, the motives, the, the deep things of the heart. And the counselor, the, like for myself, I don't have to do any of that work. I can't. I'm a human. I can't as much as I want to, as much as like any professional counselor can sit down with someone. I won't know fully the depths of your heart and the intents and the motives behind your heart. But the word of God can do that through the Holy Spirit. And that conviction starts happening and that eye opening correction and report. And then these people on their own start realizing that there's some deeper issues with themselves. And that's such a powerful thing compared to like secular talk therapy, where it's like reach within yourself, you know, let's analyze, let's find things. It's very empty. But I just want to go a little bit deeper and talk about like effective biblical counseling, because I think maybe in our culture and biblical counseling is a new movement, like it's recent. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to put years on it, but it's recent. Biblical counseling is not like a one problem, one verse, one solution type of counseling. It's not like where I just like take a note, put in my prescription of that one verse scripture, shove it, you know, in your hand and yeah. off you go and you're healed. It's so different than that. And I hope that a lot of people listening that go to Christian counseling understand that like an effective biblical counselor will take the Bible as a whole and look at various passages and immerse the counselee in the word of God and help them kind of understand, first of all, who their God is and what he's capable of and where they're at in their journey. There's so much power in that because then so much correction, just motivation comes out of that, mm -hmm. that people are excited to change. They have the tools to change. And then there's this hope that's not just in this world, but it's eternal that comes with it. Good intro, long intro. Uh, the goal uh, today is to talk about three things or three different areas of life. First, I want to address several questions when it comes to marriage and like more specific issues and problems. Uh, to talk about parenting, I know you have experience. Uh, you have your own family plus uh, counseling families and children and common problems that you know, we as parents encounter. And then the third part is for some people that are listening, maybe they don't have this counseling ministry established counselors at their church. And if they want to start this at their church, I'd like us for you to share the steps, initial steps, where they can go to get resources to get that initial start to establish this ministry at their church. But starting with marriage. And to have a list of specific questions asked uh, on social media, some people submitted. And you've touched on this uh, question already, but maybe more specific steps that the husband or wife can take. Uh, so first, what can a wife do if she feels like she doesn't love her husband anymore and have any regrets marrying the husband? Yeah, so the first thing I want to say before we address the question is falling out of love is not an excuse or a means for divorce, like that doesn't justify divorce. There's going to be seasons in all of our lives where we are decreasing our love or increasing our love based on certain stressors, certain things that creep into our marriages. Because guess what? Satan is a thief. He's cunning. He's deceitful. And he's after the marriage union. Because if he can break that, then he can break the faith of the offspring, those coming out of that marriage. And that's his goal is to decrease the number of people um, that Christ is coming to get, right? So, the Bible speaks a lot about this. I think of first Peter, I don't know, like three or four um, when I think of this and he gives advice exactly about that. Like, Hey, if you have an unbelieving husband or you feel you're unequally yoked or you're just like not clicking and you're not the same, what are you ought to do? Well, one of the things it says is you continue showing through your conduct, persevering and doing your part as a wife. And if you're doing a godly thing where you uh, walk out spiritually in gentleness um, show Christ like forgiveness, sacrifice, and just uh, have that gentle and quiet spirit, it's going to do some form of convicting in the husband's soul. So I think that a lot of times, maybe these unequally yoked marriages or moments where we fall out of love, the wives get discouraged because, and then they fail and they quit doing their part. But we ought to have hope based on these scriptures that if we walk out as wives in our roles, which means what does that look like? pursuing Christ daily, staying in his ward, armoring up for anything that comes our way that day, then there's going to be some form of conviction in the husband through the wife's conduct. And what a cool thing we as wives have an opportunity to impact a soul that may be walked away or distanced from the Lord just by our conduct and, a, and by our actions and by our words. I think that's huge. 
And a lot of times we make marriage as wives all about ourselves, like, and all about just like this shallow meaning of like earthly marriage. But there's so much, something deeper and bigger than that, right? There's, mm. we're going to talk later about maybe the mystery of marriage. And Paul speaks to that. Like it's bigger than just between a man and a woman, this union, right? It speaks to the Christ and his church, the bride. That's the little glimpse we get out of this marriage here on earth of what that relationship looks like between Jesus and us. And so having that opportunity, and I think practically speaking, right, from the counseling perspective, like what were the reasons that made you drift apart, that made you fall out of love with your spouse? I think a lot of times we just lose hope and quit without really like looking and digging deep and analyzing and as wives. And it's going to be multiple things, right? And at first they start so subtly, but if we can be detectives and just look back on our past and examine what were the things that the devil placed as like wedges that just made us go down this slippery slope. And the last thing I want to add to that, like any relationship requires work, right? Mm -hmm. And if both parties quit, like Satan wins, but as if one party is still fighting for that marriage and is still moving forward, then there's going to be some sort of traction in that marriage as it distance to kind mm -hmm. of draw it closer together. And we as wives can take on that role through the power of Christ, like study your husband, pursue him, spend time with him, work on that relationship so it draws closer together. What if a wife has been doing that? You know, a month goes by, a year goes by, maybe a couple years goes by, and she really wants to spark something and there is no reaction from the other side. The husband checked out, maybe not formally, legally divorced, but mentally the husband's checked out out of marriage. What should wife do in that position? That's a hard question. And it's always case by case, right? There's so many different scenarios that can play into why, the many reasons of why. But I think that we as wives should continue in hope and we cannot just depend on ourselves. So now you're asking that second layer. Like at first you look at yourself as a spouse, what you can do in your Christ-like behavior to influence your husband. And this is where church comes in, the church family and church-based counseling. Like if this couple goes to Living Hope Church, the wife is still pursuing her husband and she's done this for months or maybe a year or two. Now she has the church resources, our counseling at Hope Link, our leaders like you and our pastors, like to engage them, to see if they can influence and motivate and speak to the husband and to put like encouraging people not to condemn him or convict him of whatever, right? And that he's not doing a good job, but to inspire him or just to place people that are like pouring into him in a positive way. That's huge. And that's why church-based counseling works because you are no longer defeated as you're the only means of this through Christ. But now the church family comes around you and then we try uh, engaging the husband, hanging out with them, loving on them. That's mm -hmm. really what it is. People are pokey and broken because they're not loved. They don't have the community. They're isolated majority of the time. And so coming around them as a church family, that's one of the first keys to open up that heart of the husband to, to start engaging. Got it. What if the reason for, quote unquote, falling out of love because of abuse? And before that, what's considered abuse as far as when it comes to verbal? Because could be, there could be horrible communication, yelling. How does one distinguish between like, hey, I'm being verbally abused and we're just bad at communicating? Yeah. Well, do you mind if I back up and go first to physical yes, abuse? Yes, yes. I ahead. think it's important not to miss it and to address it first. We at Living Hope Church believe that any form of physical abuse in the marriage is not okay. It's not tolerated. And it's something that should be brought to light and should bring in our church leaders to assist and help with. I think a lot of churches these days talk about like suffer well. Mm -hmm. But my message to the churches out there is shelter well, protect her well. Like if a wife comes seeking support, we as a church ought to protect. And I'm not saying like go straight to divorce. What I'm saying is that there's means for separation at this time to keep the spouse that's being abused physically safe. And so in this minute, I just want to say, if this is one of your listeners, there's the national hotline, right? Um, maybe we can post the number on the bottom of the video as we talk. But I would say don't keep it to yourself. Tell the pastors, reach out to someone, call this number, but make it known, expose it and, re and, and just seek help. I mean, church is the first place that you can go to if you find safe 
uh, either counselors or leaders, but it's never okay to endure it. A lot of people, I think they're scared because of the rumors that can happen or, or the church can advise in those ways. So seek out a good church family that you can really open up to, um, to receive that help. But now going back to emotional and verbal abuse, right? They kind of fall in the same bucket, but here's how you can kind of decipher the difference between the two. Verbal, right? Mm -hmm. Verbal abuse, like yelling, defaming, uh, cussing, just terrible words against the spouse in angry, loud voices, right? Emotional abuse can be hidden, kind of like sarcastic comments, passive aggressive comments, jokes, but it messes with your mind and it diminishes your self-worth and it really beats you down. So I think that's kind of one of the differences, but we can put it together in the same bucket as we address it, right? Mm -hmm. So if somebody is going through verbal verbal emotional abuse what can they do to fix that yeah i think that we go through a few points when we do couples counseling and we and we identify that this is the problem but the really the first thing to do is to recognize it a lot of these wives that are in emotionally abusive relationships they don't want to admit it or they can't they're just blind to it and so we get together, we kind of go through the facts and we help them recognize both parties that there is actually emotional abuse happening in this marriage. During this time, we work separately with the husband and the wife. And the biggest thing that we're going after is for the wife to recognize because oftentimes they're in denial. This is the love of their life, their husband, right? They don't want to say that they just they're close and attracted to them and they want to stay in this relationship. So with the wife, we work to recognize it with the husband. We work for them to willingly repent in front of the Lord and recognize that this is a heavy sin that they've done. And just a side note, emotional abuse is often kind of both ways at different mm -hmm. percentages. So it's never like a hundred percent, the guy, the husband and 0% the wife, there's always some level to it. So repentance needs to happen after recognition of that. Right. And then after that reconciliation, we bring them together and now we work together. And this is the part we talked about earlier. Like once we split them up and they work on their relationship with the Lord first, as God renews the man, the inner man. They put off the old habits, the old self, the old way of thinking and their old way of addressing their wife. And now this new creation starts to walk it out. It's, it's a, kind of like a toddler walking, waddling at first. It's not perfect, but we walk hand in hand with this couple, helping them as the husband's this like renewed man after being, after being forgiven by his wife, forgiven by the Lord. And now this process of reconciliation is a little bit awkward because now they're kind of like relearning kind of like a new person in front of them to get used to and to um, practice marriage together. And so <clears throat> the wife might still be kind of defensive or go back to her old ways of her part of the emotional abuse. And so you kind of coach them and you guide them and you walk near them. And as they practice it out, then from that comes a great testimony. And then we never tell the couple to just like praise God, go on your way. No, we tell them like, hey, this was meant for something. Like, obviously it brought you closer to the Lord. Now go find another couple. Maybe you know someone that's dealing with similar things and use what you've gone through to encourage them, to teach them to. And so that's what our church is really built on. I love Living Hope Church. We have like this mentoring mentality. Like if we've gone through something, go find someone else and help them, build them up. And so we create marriage mentors out of that. Prayer room is an opportunity every Wednesday for us to go share like praise reports or like moments of testimonies of what God walked us through. And it can encourage other people and make that ripple effect and inspire others. Oh, shout out to Living Hope Church pastors and the testimony of them believing in counseling and marriages and just helping people grow in their tough times. And the testament of that is Living Hope Church first paid staff was biblical counselors, so which is awesome for pastors that could have spent money elsewhere on yeah. different projects, but they believed enough. The first paid staff, official paid staff at Living Hope Church uh, was biblical counselor. And uh, thank you for, again, for all of your ministry and sacrifice. And through your advice, through your counseling, you seem like you're always leading back to back to the word of God, back to their relationship with God. If someone is going through different seasons of their marriage, for them to not get bogged down in the details and the problems of their marriage, for them to have a bigger view of this is what marriage is supposed to be. In your understanding, what is the purpose of a Christian biblical marriage? Yeah, touched on it a little bit earlier as well, but um, another shout out to Living Hope Church. So one of our growth groups is called Wifeline. And we mm -hmm. gather like four weeks out of the 
quarter and we just go through passages together. And, and one of those times we gathered was exactly for this reason. We talked about with wives, what is the purpose and the meaning of marriage? And we looked at scripture and what Paul talked about, the mystery behind marriage. And he quotes Genesis, right? From the very beginning, God said, you will become one flat flesh. Mm -hmm. You will leave your father and your mother and you will cleave together. And this is the great mystery, he says now, the Christ and the church. And so there's always this deeper, greater mere meaning in marriage that Satan wants to distract us from. Like he wants us to be so busy fighting against each other, desiring something for it for ourselves here on earth, missing the bigger point, that eternal perspective of like marriage is just a glimpse, a taste of what the relationship, that closeness with the Lord, that full knowing of who he is and that sacrifice and forgiveness and that leadership, all those qualities in our marriage, the ones that are done right, are just a little glimpse and a reflection of what our relationship is with Christ. And God designed it that way, just like he designed parenting, like the relationship between the father and his kids, right? We now know a little glimpse of what that is like with our heavenly father and how much he loves us because man, our little ones got us mad at certain <laughs> points and we still forgave because we love them so hard. The same thing with marriage. Like you love that person. Even sometimes as me or my husband, we sin and we stray away, we forgive. Mm -hmm. And that's an example of how much Christ forgives we see that in the Old Testament, how the nation of Israel would just like keep sinning, keep sinning. And what a merciful God he was. Um, it's just beautiful to me to see that marriage is something that is a greater thing. That's part of eternity. It's a glimpse of what Jesus's relationship with us is. That's awesome. That's, I'm like getting encouraged. I'm like, oh, it's <laughs> a time for an altar call. That's awesome to, to have that view of marriage. And when you are counseling people and biblical counseling, that there is the eternal and almighty a hope for every marriage in whatever situation it may it, be. It really changes the wife's perspective on why she should keep fighting, mm -hmm. why she should keep pushing for this marriage to work because she's a sanctifying tool and God in his sovereign will put her together with exactly this stubborn, prideful guy mm -hmm. because God knew that only she could be that person who can stir him into conviction through her conduct, through her gentle and quiet spirit to go to Christ and be convicted and change. And that is such an exciting thing as wives that we have this opportunity to be a sanctifying tool and for our husbands to do that to us as well. Great transition. So a wife can be yeah. the kind, serving, patient uh, soul, but she's also human and she makes yeah, and she has her flaws and mistakes. So now from like a 30,000 fee view to a lot more down to earth practical, mm -hmm. what are some <laughs> common mistakes wives make in their marriages that can lead to tension and conflict? I was thinking about this question and um, I think three came up to mind. They dominate, they mm -hmm. nag, and they compare. Those are the top offenders for me as mm -hmm. I kind of see it in my cases. I see it in my own life. Yeah, but if we think about it, yeah, let's three. dig into each one of those three. So dominate, right? For some reason, well, we'll get to that reason, biblically mm -hmm. speaking, in a minute. Um, but we tend to dominate. We want to take over, right? Uh, there's so many... Like if we look at the sports lingo, get the husband's attention for a second. Like, why is it that in sports, in Olympics, we have separate female and male sports? And of course, there's controversy going on about that <laughs> right now. Like there's leagues for boys and for girls. And we don't mix those because that competition does not align. There's differences there. Right. But when it comes into marriage, for some reason, us wives, we think that we have the right and the tools and the abilities to dominate and to win and to compete against our husbands. And this goes back to the curse and the fall. Back in Genesis 3.16, it talks about how the wife will want to rule and dominate over her husband. And, and the world is always going to want us to shift into that curse and that fallen world brokenness if we don't actively fight against it and challenge ourselves and examine ourselves as wives. So that's dominance. I think that we just dominate because of that fallen world that we live in, but also because of the passiveness of our husbands. And I think that comes out of the fact that over time, as we may be, and maybe we'll talk about this later, as we nag and as we want our husbands to be leaders, we kind of start stepping over them and taking the dominant role in the marriage. And that in turn, like puts our husbands in, in the back, on the back burner, kind of like quiet in the back. And then we don't even want to as wives, but we come to a point in life in our marriages where we're like fully dominant, making all the decisions. And maybe I, as I talk to a lot of these wives, they hate it, but they got themselves to that point. Mm -hmm. So it, 
it's like this balance of like it takes a husband leader, but it also takes a wife who submits and respects and gives him opportunities to lead and asks him for, you know, advice and, and things. So so what does so, a wife do if the husband is not stepping up to the plate and somebody needs to lead and take charge of the family? How do you balance that? Yeah, I think a discerning wife that's in the word will have, first of all, trust in her God. I think a lot of times we dominate out of fear. Like we're afraid that if we don't take the step right now, something will either happen in parenting our kids or financial decisions will be made. And really deeper down, digging into the heart issue of it, like we don't really trust the Lord. Mm -hmm. I don't trust the Lord with the fact that my husband can eventually come to a decision where he can provide for my family or parent my kids well. And so that's the deep issue of the heart. There's a mistrust there in our God who put our husband in our families. And so we try to take over and dominate because we want that control. We want that assurance because we're lacking that trust. Um, That's one of them. The second one is just patience. I think we as wives, we're like 100 miles per hour changing our husbands at our speed and rate of change while God has his rate of change for the spouse, for our husbands. Mm -hmm. And it's slower because he's doing the the deeper work within the heart. That's like the permanent changing. And we just can't wait for that. And so again, being still in the Lord, trusting God, that's what it all goes back to. And that's kind of why the heart root issue is to, so a good fix for that would be first to work on our trust with God. And how do we do that? We go into his word and we look at the attributes of God. Like my God is my provider. He's Jaira. He's all knowing. He's so merciful. He's so good to me. He's so loving. Like I'll trust in him and I'll sit back in that trust and just bask in it and allow my husband through his mistakes. If that's the passive husband we're dealing with in this case to kind of get to that level, but give him the opportunity. And so practically that's one of the things. And then asking him for advice, giving him opportunities to lead, not jumping in and just like right away trying to, because it's the speed that's after, right? Or the fear of not having control. Um, So I think that's the big root issues behind dominance. So first one was dominance. Yeah. The second one is nagging. And nagging is something that falls right into the same kind of description that we said. We nag because we want the change. We want something to happen. But we also nag because like James 4 talks about, like we have conflict and we nag because of our own desires that are just boiling within us. There's something that we want and he's not giving us. And so we're going to nag at him and nag at him until we think we're going to get it. But it's actually like doing the reverse. It's irritating the husband. It's shutting him down. It's discouraging any effort. And so we as wives kind of do the opposite and we harm for our own good, like we harm the progress Mm -hmm. instead of promoting it. And so what can we do opposite of that? What are some of the tools wives can take on? And I think just exalting him, words of affirmation, like giving him opportunities to lead and then also following up with words of affirmation to make him feel like he's leading, even though maybe it's half seas, maybe he did a terrible job praying for dinner, but hey, he prayed for dinner, like for the first time in a couple of months, like give him some words of affirmation and encourage him and give him more opportunities to do it again. But first Peter, again, first Peter, I think it was three or four. It talks about like through our conduct, not by our word, do we win our husbands mm-hmm. and change their behaviors. When you take a nag and one of the jokes comes to mind is that if a husband said he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Stop reminding him every six months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a uh, really good advice and practical stuff. So we got dominance, we got nagging, and the third one? Was comparing in this day and age of social media and just like everybody boasting with their fake pictures of what their husbands are doing for them. It's hard not to compare, right? Mm-hmm. We start getting envious and jealous of others. And we put ourselves in that trap because we as wives expose ourselves to that. I think if we sit majority of the, of the day, not in the word, but out there on social media or some of these influencers or even just like some of the places and the people we expose ourselves to, not people who want to like dwell in conversations centered that are Christ centered, but more about like just pursuing the American dream or striving for these materialistic things and having that perfect family. Those things rub off on us in a negative way. We kind of gather and soak that in as a sponge and then we take that home and it blinds us. It totally takes away from all the positive traits that our husband has, because now we're bringing all the stuff that we want our husband to have. And we totally miss the point as wives to look at all the things your husband's doing, because maybe her husband's doing this, but he's missing out on so many other things that if we bring that comparison and envy and jealousy in, we're missing so many of the good qualities. And so as we counsel women who compare, who have that envy and jealousy, 
we tell them, cut off social media, cold turkey. Mm -hmm. If we examine their friend groups, if there's people who are just negative and draining them instead of pouring into them, cut those people out. Take the four week challenge. That's what we always say. In those four weeks, pour into the word of God and see what it teaches you on how to build others up, how to kind of love sacrificially, right? Mm -hmm. And also find all the positive characteristics in your husband. Like every day, just three things that you love about your husband. Write them down and then pray for them like in Thanksgiving prayers, right? And then these wives, me included, as I practice this, we start focusing on all the good things that our husbands do mm -hmm. have. And then we start appreciating them. And that in turn draws us closer uh, in our intimacy and an emotional kind of connectedness. Nice, nice. Thank you for that. In your experience, what are some ways wives may intentionally or unintentionally undermine their husband's confidence or sense of worth in a relationship? Yeah. So if we think about that word undermine, it's kind of like if you look at the definition of it, it's kind of like erode or take away from the foundation, kind of like a river flowing and it erodes the riverbanks. Mm -hmm. That's literally what undermining your husband is. It's kind of like eroding at his self-worth or his respect in the family. And that's done so subtly, kind of like a drip drop. There's a proverb about that. Mm -hmm. um, but if it drip drops on a cement over time, there's going to be a little dent that starts carving out. And we as wives, we do this and it starts off maybe like you said, unintentionally, or maybe it is intentional because we're not getting what we selfishly want and we're frustrated and we're taking it out in our actions and words towards our husbands. But I think it's always uh, criticizing him. That's one of them, like either in front of him or in front of others. It could be in such a subtle way, but like in a joking way. And I struggled with this in like my first years of marriage, just jokingly making fun of my husband. That is not okay. That is a form of criticizing my husband and, or putting him down in my head as I view him or towards others, right? So that's one of them. Another one is not uh, mothering him kind of in a negative way, kind of like he's not capable of doing this. So I'm just going to do this for him. It kind of puts him in a place of like the other children. Mm -hmm. And we have those jokes about like having the three children instead of two, because your husband counts as one of them. Mm -hmm. That's like the thing our society talks about these days, but that's not okay. I think as women, we can't mother our husbands because it puts us in the wrong alignment of how we view them. And then we start un undermining them out of that. Right. I think another one is just questioning his decisions. That's something we always do as wives. It's like, well, are you sure we're making that choice, this financial choice? Like, and, and it get, puts doubt in his mind and it tells him that you're completely 100% sure he's going to screw up. And this was a bad decision to start with. But it also gives you this view of your husband that he's not making the right decision. So you don't trust him. So, you know, he's just going to blow this thing up. And then you start undermining him with comments as you go. So that's another way. I have a couple more, but uh, if you, they come, they come. <laughs> we'll see. You, you mentioned fi yeah, finances. How can wives approach financial discussions with their husbands constructively to minimize friction. Yeah. So there's over like 2,300 verses on finances. At first, when, when leaders like you go up on stage and like announce for giving, I'm like, man, they have like a couple verses. But then when I started digging into it, you guys have 2,300 <laughs> opportunities to speak on tithing at our announcement. Give me the list later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Side note, totally distracted. But hey, the Bible is rich in telling us on how to steward our finances. And there's three things before we answer the question that I want to cover. Like God is the owner of everything. Psalms is rich with that. Like everything belongs to him. A thousand cattle on a thousand hills, probably butchered that, but hey. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second part is like, we are just stewards of that. And he's such a good provider. Like our God is Jaira. We mentioned that earlier. He just gives mercifully, provides for us. He takes care of the grasses and the lilies. How much more does he care for us? And we are to steward that well. So that's something that should be established and talked about in every couple's marriage, right? As we talk about like our mission, our goals in our marriages. But as wives, practically, what can we do when there's issues with finances or if there's some kind of big decisions we have to make? The first thing I always say is drain the drama. Like your tears, your exaggeration, your emotions are not going to help your husband who is not in a, a feeling emotional wavelength driven. He's more on the logical. It's just going to frustrate him and get him stuck. And you guys are going to have a block in your communication if you come into this kind of business meeting in the marriage with all this drama and emotion. So drain the drama, leave the emotions behind and come into this meeting 
and try to be his support and his help me, which is what God designed you to be. And sometimes what that looks like is to be a sounding board. Like as your husband logically thinks through ways on how to move forward in this decision financially, hard to crawl out of debt or something, have him bounce off ideas, help him brainstorm and affirm him, right? And then ultimately at the end, if he doesn't, encourage prayer, like start and end everything in prayer. And I think that will confirm and help you guys see clearly and make the next steps when there is financial trouble. Is the drama and emotions, is that usually a common mistake the spouses do when when it comes to any conflict resolution? Or to more specifically, what are some mistakes the couples make when they're trying to resolve conflict? Yeah. I think as wives, as women in general, uh, we thrive on emotions and feelings and drama and exaggeration. Mm -hmm. That's just how we're wired, right? Um, But you're asking about conflict, so let's go there. There's different ways and different tactics or like different modes in which we address conflict as wives. And this is something that we're going to just kind of look at and analyze. Like, which one are you? Look back on your previous like week's conflicts and see which one you are. Mm -hmm. And there's four. There's two A's and two C's. So I'm going to try not to butcher them and try to... Uh, cover each one of them. So two A's, two C's. The first one is accommodating. Like you win, I lose. I'm going to accommodate you. And it's like a people pleasing one, right? So the wife's not going to be confrontational. She doesn't want to speak up. But then out of that conflict resolution style, like the wife's needs are never heard, never met. She's kind of like on the sideline. The husband just dominates and does his thing because he always wins and she's just on the sidelines, never vocal. So that's one of them. So accommodating is agreeable, don't want conflict. And it could, be, and it could go either way. The husband could be yeah, that exactly. kind of posture or probably more common, the wife. Mm-hmm. So first one, accommodating. Yeah. So in that case, the husband wins and or the one of the spouses wins, the other one loses. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's accommodating. The other one is avoiding. And I relate and I sit in this group. And I think a lot of women that I counsel, I see they sit in this group. Like we are such victims and so emotionally driven. We just isolate because we want our husbands to just pursue us in that conflict to death. Mm -hmm. But in this point, like you lose and I lose because there's no communication happening to reconcile, resolve this conflict. There's no identifying of the issues. It's just silence. It's just isolation. And the husbands at this point, they'll do it for a little bit, a couple of cycles, but then they're like, they give up because they don't, they're tired. They know there's not going to be any outcome coming out of that. And it just requires a lot of effort for them to pursue an avoiding spouse. Mm-hmm. So avoiding is I lose and you lose. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, so that's accommodating, avoiding. Uh, and then we have the two C's. So the next one is competing. So competing is I win and you lose. So a lot of like dominant spouses or my way or the highway spouses, they're like my way and I'm not going to negotiate. I'm not going to give anything. I win or nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then those are like the, the fights that break down and then couples don't collaborate together. And then they just kind of like slowly distance over time and no decisions are made. So these are stuck marriages. And I said the the, the fourth one, which is the second C, which is collaborating. Mm -hmm. Um, Collaborating is we both win, right? You win and I win because we negotiate, we work together and we meet in the middle. So out of those four, you kind of can look back as a wife and see which one are you. And if you're in that avoiding place, start pushing yourself to speak up, not to leave the room, to try to address things, right? If you are that collaborating couple, you're right where you need to be. And we teach this tool using the visual of a baseball diamond. Like there's four bases as you negotiate, as you collaborate as a couple. So first you have to like identify what the problem is. Like, why are we fighting? A lot of times it's out of emotions because we're tired because there's stressors that are outside of our marriage that are causing us to fight. So we don't even know why we're fighting. So sitting down, clearing the emotions out of the room and just really understanding what is this problem. And then the second base would be like making sure that that problem is validated by both spouses. Is this a big deal? Is this something worth fighting about? Uh, I mean, at that point, one of the spouses can be like, hey, this is really not a big deal. Like, let's just do it your way and we're fine. And then you don't have to finish to home run. You can just be done at second base. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of um, confirming whether the problem is really worth fighting for. The third base is the base where you decide to problem solve and then you negotiate. And if you think about kind of like the spectrum of the two spouses, this is my way and this is my way. We're all going to negotiate and meet in the middle. So that means in one conflict, I'm going to give 70 and I'm going to give 30, but we're going to give of something of each of us to mm-hmm. meet in the middle and to find the middle ground. And other times it's going to be 50, 50 other times it's going to be 10 and 90, but we're negotiating, we're working together. And each spouse is the one that's giving 
both of them are giving. Um, and then we come to home base, which is now we have a solution to our problem. And now we agree to walk it out. And to walk it out, you have to have some kind of rules in place like, hey, this is what we're not going to do. These are non-negotiables. And this is how we're going to move forward in our plan. But I'm you're listening to all those the two A's and two C's and like, and I'm thinking, well, that takes seems like a lot of like intentional and right communication. And I think that's maybe a often it falls apart when it comes to co collaboration, compromise with one, between two spouses. Why is it so hard for husband and wife to communicate well? Yeah, I think you, you're spot on. Like the stem or the root of a lot of our conflicts, a lot of our misunderstandings, unmet needs is communication, right? And it's something that at Living Hope Church, we do premarital counseling and it's one of our sessions. We take a full session you happen to lead it. Uh, and we talk about like good, effective communication. What does that look like? Um, I'll give you a funny example. Uh, sometimes I watch couples and I'm, it's actually really fun in a session when a couple starts fighting because you can totally like analyze and see what are the faults and start addressing them in oncoming sessions. So it's a good thing when couples fight. But sometimes I watch couples talk to each other and they're literally having two separate conversations about something because they're not actively listening. So he can be talking about one thing, but she's so busy defending another point that she's trying to explain to us that they're like totally on different wavelengths. And so one of the tools is active listening. And what active listening requires is like heart listening. Like it's the hardest thing for the wife to do because we're either building a case against this man or we're like waiting to interrupt. That's me. My husband is probably going <laughs> to snicker when he hears this, but like waiting to interrupt to share the next tab that's open in our web browser of 20 tabs. Mm -hmm. So the husband's still like on the same point and I moved on to like 10 other conversations and it's confusing, man, at this point. Mm -hmm. And so actively listening on that point as a wife, what does that look like? Exactly that is listening. But then here's a tip for you, for all of us wives, follow up with a question that makes you stop defending or building a case or start going into the next subject. Like challenge yourself to follow up with a question to whatever he's talking about. And it's going to show him that you care enough to know more about it. And it'll make you actively engage and listen. So that's one of the things. Um, another one is like, by the time what I want to say comes out of my mouth, it's already broken down because I don't know if you can reference this Madagascar reference, but Alex the lion was like, by the time, uh, or he's like, I'm not with the words coming out and having them make good things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Basically, we're not good at speaking what we mean. So like what we mean in our head is already broken down by the time it comes out of our mouth. And then from there, the spouse, when they receive this message, they receive it with a filter of bias, whether they're defensive or they're loving at that moment or whatever other things that are going on in that person's head. So that message is further broken broken down. So by the time it gets to the other spouse's brain, it's it's like completely almost different to what the spouse is trying to say. So kind of speaking back and paraphrasing is a huge tool. And it's such an awkward thing to do and people laugh at it. But we have couples practice it. And in the sessions, when they do that, they realize like, oh my gosh, no, I was saying B and D. And you said that I was saying A and C, like no way. And so when you as a spouse speak to your husband, have him paraphrase like, or you paraphrase to him. So like, honey, is this what you're saying that we're going to do this and then follow with that? And you'll see, you'll find it a lot of times helpful because he'll be like, no, that's not even close to what I'm trying to get at here. Can that's we like, <laughs> and so that's a good helpful tool uh, to use. Got it. What do you and Sergi, like what rules and traditions do you guys have to help your relationship thrive? Yeah. And I'm just going to do like a general thing that's yeah. super helpful for relationships to thrive. And I'll start off with one more tool that I forgot to mention about communication. Okay. Like a lot of times uh, couples go and beat around the bush and they're staying above ground. But it's a challenge for us as wives to take our conversations below ground into the deeper things, not just like business daily schedules of what's required, what's coming, but like really how, how your husband's feeling. Ask him about his spiritual state, like get a pulse on him. And as a wife, at first, leading with these questions might be awkward, but make it like a daily check in thing. And so overall, like for relationships to thrive, there's some cool tools that we can implement. So with premarital couples or just couples in general, we teach them something called tea time or fanos where like a daily check in happens. And here's what that looks like. So fanos is a Greek word that uh, means shed light on. And FANOS is an acronym that stands for like feelings, affirmations, needs, struggles, like other things that um, couples can chat about that can guide them. 
But this happens in a place where like for us, it would be the best place would be like in our bedroom just before bed because we're always together and we always can download or sometimes they'll come from work and our kids already know at this point, like, hey, mom and dad will need to talk. We need to download. And they know it's like a 15, 20 minute conversation where me and Sergi just check in. And we go through exactly that. We go through like our spiritual struggles that day, all the things we were feeling, the things that happened to us. So later when some kind of stressor comes to me and I act out in it, he knows where I'm coming from because he heard about my day. I already downloaded to him. So tea time or Thanos should happen on a daily. Mm -hmm. It should happen in a place where there's no electronics. So don't try to have Thanos with your husband watching the football game. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. Then, yeah. um, <laughs> and then it has to be eye contact or it has to be like active listening, right? Like we talked about previously. And then you guys take turns kind of sharing about like just the day, the things that happen and then go below ground into like the feelings that you are feeling. And this is really cool tool for husbands because as a wife, for me, it's kind of like taking off the bottle cap from like a really pressurized emotional bottle. Mm -hmm. And I just let out all my emotions and Sergi gets to hear them all out. And then after I'm done letting out emotions on a daily I'm not like ready to burst as a bomb because I'm daily letting out those emotions and processing them out loud as I'm saying them to Serge. And it's super helpful for the wife because then we can think clearly and be more logical and reasonable and not act out of our emotions in different moments when we so engage our husbands. Tea time together, just conversations together. But one of the issues that comes up is, especially with kids, multiple kids, multiple little kids, how does one balance the time, the schedule for, let's say right now, for a wife to balance her time between kids and showing them love and affection and taking care of them and time for her husband? Yeah. So the question is the question of priority. Mm -hmm. I'm going to zoom out a little bit more. I hope you're not mad about that. But can we first prioritize our eternal like walk with Christ and our pursuit of God? Like, that's the main thing. And I think we always focus so much on our marriage and on our kids that literally that Bible devotional quiet time is like the 10 minutes before bed or it's just like somewhere out there. And it's just like the least um, focused on in our days as wives. And so quick challenge for all of us wives, like, can we prioritize Christ and our pursuit of him and our quiet devotional times more than our husbands, more than our wives? It mm -hmm. sounds crazy. If you look at the plate, which represents your full day, like what percentage of it goes to Christ? And what percentage of it goes to kids and then to your husband? Like, and then of course, we're like always negative balance for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I also want to encourage that as well. So now going back to your question, like how do you prioritize your husband or your kids or should you? Like the family home atmosphere and the relationship between the father and the mom, right? It's going to influence the kids. So it doesn't matter how much you prioritize the kids. You can give them 95, 98% of your time, your energy and everything, they're not going to grow up to be good kids if they don't sense the safe, loving atmosphere of a really good, strong relationship between you and your spouse, between their dad and their mom. And so it makes sense to prioritize your husband, not only that way, but also looking at it from like eternity perspective. Like we prioritize Christ because marriage is moment momentary, like it's just here on earth and it'll pass away. There will be no marriage in heaven. And looking at it even Dig digging even deeper like our kids are even more temporary like they're with us for such a short time we're cops we're coaches and then they leave our nest and then we just become these counselors to them but they leave but our marriage our marriage is more permanent here on earth so it makes sense to work on it to prioritize it for that second reason as well but how does one prioritize if for example the husband's home from work but there's kids are screaming and fighting and hungry and it's like i'd love to be with the husband now but there's kids are screaming. So like in those settings, how do you yeah, do it? I love it. You bring up the sweetest season, which is like the greatest majority of our congregation at Living Hope Church. Those toddler years, those like uh, expected, but uh, constantly appearing ambushes and uncivil wars in the homes mm -hmm. with these little ones um, just ravaging war against us all the time. They're so cute, though. Uh, <laughs> this season is so temporary. Like it seems like when we're stuck in this season, it just drags on forever but now having a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old, I miss those days. They were such short years of my life with Sergi. It was hard in those moments. But I think if you're in that season, being planned and scheduled and having that like, okay, Monday's our date night, life or death, like mom is coming over and we're going on a date. Like grandma's coming over to watch the kids. And I think the greatest thing that wives struggle with is mom guilt. 
it's real and it's fake and it's going to haunt you until your date is over. And then when you come home, then it's going to go away and you're like, man, I should have enjoyed that time with my mm. husband more. And so we have to deal with our guilt. Like that's something Sergi taught me. It's just to set aside everything. Like our kids are so moldable and so uh, flexible. Like they'll survive anything, especially a cozy grandma who just feeds them borscht <laughs> and, and cartoons, right? They're going to be fine for those two hours. But what a precious time it is. And if we don't schedule that time of just being intimate and close together and going out, having fun, pursuing each other, knowing and studying each other, uh, Satan's going to take that time away from us. And it's always going to be some sort of explosion or somebody's overworked or somebody's not slept and tired. And then that time's just going to slip away from us if we don't put it in our calendars and we don't kind of disciplined stick to it. Got it. So it's like a non-negotiable in the home, I would say. You got to have a date night and then you got to have a mom night where you just go and you take care of yourself once a week. Like antique shopping or something? Yeah. Antique shopping, <laughs> not plant shopping. Not talking <laughs> Uh, thank you. And a great transition, even touching on husbands and uh, parenting spouses priorities. Um, so that's a lot of very good advice and information on marriage. Second part, parenting. But before we get to parenting, every episode, I get in trouble from my friends. And that's talking to people that are still listening. The, I never ask people to subscribe or to follow so if you've made it this far, if you haven't done it yet, if you're listening, I think we're on YouTube, on Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, whatever platform you're, you're on, please press the subscribe button so my friends don't yell at me anymore for not asking to do that. But thank you for listening. But back to the conversation, a great transition for going from priorities, husbands and uh, kids, parenting. What are some of the common mistakes parents make when it comes to setting boundaries and discipline for their children? I'm just going to talk in like super broad yeah. and just two things that I picked out and I'll summarize it in these words. We raise little adult emperors. And let me explain that. We raise little adults because the minute they turn two, we shove them into preschool, we sign them up for soccer and piano lessons and like kind of hand them the suitcase, kind of make them grow up too fast. We want them to like, and that's the culture we live in right now. It's like a competition. Like, is Johnny going to be in soccer with Katie or is Katie going to like outcompete him and be in club by the time she's in elementary school? And so there's this pressure on parents to make their kids grow up way faster and I'm so guilty of that. Like I put Melanie all sorts of places. But what happens as parents is we rob them of their childhood and we rob them of opportunities to be bored and also of opportunities to just like go and explore, let alone like the backyard with our uh, cement jungle. I'm not even speaking of like the nature and all mm -hmm. of that. But we also raise little emperors and kings and queens because from the very smallest age, and I'm speaking out of my own sad experience, like we cater to them to the point where they have no hardships whatsoever. There's no natural consequences that follow any of their actions because mom's running around fixing all of those things and taking on the consequences for herself. And then later on, it's coming to, ba to bite us, basically, because... These kids grow up thinking that they deserve everything on a silver platter and everybody's owed them everything and they've never had any hardships. So the minute something hits them as they get into their youth and their adult life, like they start melting like snowflakes. And so I think those are the two big things that we should watch out as parents is to just let our kids be bored. It activates their imagination. And then the third one, which is my primary big one, is like we don't take daily moments to teach the gospel, preach the gospel and show the gospel. Like, it's okay while we're making mashed potatoes to talk, to bring Christ into the conversation. It's okay as we're driving to soccer practice to ask a Bible question or, you know, have these uh, with our Sophia. She's our theologian. She always asks these deep questions. And it's always like, we're getting ready for something. Everybody's late. Like the teapot's going and the pot is overflowing. And Sophia's like, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> or like, why did God create even Adam without belly buds or whatever? <laughs> but, you know, we have to engage them. That's so healthy. And we stop everything and we just take those two, five minutes to talk about that or just like be the ones to bring that up in conversations. Have the gospel message, have Christ be the center of everything. What are your views and thoughts on gentle parenting? I think the only gentleness that belongs in parenting is to show the mercy and the forgiveness of Christ. I think that gentleness 
um, has been kind of ruined because we're so soft on our kids. If we're just doing with separate from the gospel, right? If we're just being a gentle parent, we're not requiring obedience from them. We're just letting them kind of rogue. Every child, they crave order. They crave discipline and they crave that obedience. Ephesians, I think five or six talks about it like that, uh, probably for the household conduct, like children obey your parents. It's biblical for us to require that obedience out of our children. And we notice that kids who grow up in households that have obedience, that have consequences. And here's the side note. Your obedience has to be clearly communicated to the kids. They have to know what's expected of them. So it's not like a surprise and they have to know the consequences of it. And then the third piece is we have to actually follow through with these consequences. I'm the offender here. Like my husband, he follows through with the consequences. But those cute kids are, man, they're so adorable and they're so innocent. You just want to love on them. But no, you have to follow through with the consequences. Sometimes that punishment is going to do so much teaching and molding in that child instead of you gentle parenting and comforting them and omitting the consequence. And another one is just like natural consequences for teens, right? Like, or for toddlers, like if, for example, if a teen is speeding and they scratch their com- car bumper or they got a speeding ticket, you let that teen work and pay their own money for that speeding ticket or fix their own car. So they see that natural consequence. Like it, it's biblical, like that law of harvest, whatever mm-hmm. you sow, you will reap. Let our kids experience that law of harvest, like starting from a young age. What about the fear that parents may have the if the child is young and when there's discipline, physical discipline, and the fear is that the child will dislike the parent, be bitter towards the parent, and it will become even more disobedient because of, you can say, the hatred towards the parents. Yeah, I think that's the case when that's the only thing that's that is happening is just the discipline piece itself. Every kind of discipline that you speak of should be followed with love and conversation. And so as you discipline your child with a rod, whatever your form or means of discipline is, afterwards, after the consequence is over, you bring your child close and you make them know that you love them so much. And you bring the gospel into it and you explain to them that what they've done not only wronged you as a parent, but like it wronged God. And how does this look in, in terms of eternity and, and what they've done and the impact they had on the Lord and how it was not pleasing to him? And I think having that raw and vulnerable conversation will make that moment so enriching and memorable for the child that they're not going to have any bitterness or, or any of that because they're going to know that there's something deeper where Christ is brought into the picture. And then they see that, you know, they've wronged God and they have godly sorrow and they learn to work through those things and grow out of them. To make it like even more like practical or step by step, not talking from experience. Let's say you have a four year old, and they have a food a plate of food on their table, and there's the kid saying, "Oh, I don't want to eat this. I don't like this food," and they push the plate off and on the floor and spill it everywhere. And say they've done it before. You've corrected them, and they looking at you pushes the plate off the table. What is a proper procedure for correction and discipline in that moment when does the conversation happen how does the conversation happen and let's say then discipline what happens after the discipline yeah let's zoom out and talk about two bigger things and then we'll go into the practical Mm -hmm. the first thing i say is your child does not have a phd in nutrition Mm -hmm. so they can't boss you around about telling you what they want to eat or what they don't want to eat and how much of it and when they should have candy or broccoli right i think a lot of times we're like oh you know johnny's bossing us around so we're just gonna let it be and let him win like you're the one with authority you're the one with the mind that god puts you as a parent for that child to give them wise advice to guide them and parent them in proper ways. So that's number one. I think number two is we function out of the authority as a parent that is a godly authority. Mm -hmm. And we also work with kids who have a really strong will and a really gentle spirit. And our job as parents is to wisely with discernment, case by case, break that will, Mm -hmm. which is through consistent discipline and through consistent, like following through with whatever the requirements are, but also harbor and protect that spirit. And so that's where we have to really watch like our approach, if we're being really harsh, because sometimes, man, that meter, those little things in diapers, they just Mm -hmm. push that boiling meter until it reaches a point where you're like ready to just yell and do all kinds of things. And 
unfortunately, in some cases, parents like kind of go out of their way and physically like abuse, God forbid, or do things that they regret later. And so in those moments, check your meter of where you're at on your anger and how you're going to react. And if you need to walk away, especially as fathers or maybe mothers who are sleep deprived, like walk away from that situation in the moment, but also control yourself to the point where you can gently rationally because you're they're going to watch you. And if you're screaming your head off at them and shoving broccoli in their throat, like they're going to be a sponge and they're going to mimic and copy and paste that in their life to other people when they are not doing what they want. So we have to be very careful in our approach of that, right? But following through in consistency is key. And that's the breaking will piece. And a lot of times, us as parents, there's this threshold. And we quit like right here before that threshold. And it clicks for the child. And so I would say just continue following through in a rational, calm, gentle way. Just repeating what's required of them. And showing them that you're the authority. And you're the one who is in the know. And they're the ones to uh, have to obey you. Because that's their thing. Remember, they want to challenge you. They want to see how far they can push you. And sadly, if we're not consistent... They sense and they can smell when they uh, push you too far and if they've gone too far and then it works and then they're going to go farther the next time. And then it diminishes your authority. Their will is just wild and untamed and we're in trouble as parents. And what do you think about the view to add to the consistency part that when we are not consistent, then especially for the younger kids, it may be confusing for them because let's say last time she pushed the plate off the table she got punished and then second time she doesn't she didn't get punished because the mom and the dad were too busy or didn't have time to deal with that and now she didn't get punished that time so now in her mind she's like well i don't know is this bad because last time i got punished today i didn't get punished so i don't even know if this kind of what what i should be doing with this but if it's consistent let's say she pushed it off punished pushed it off again punished again and she knows like okay if i push this off i know there's a punishment coming now it's like well, I don't know what's going to happen. It's unpredictable. Is that also not helpful for the kids? Absolutely. And you're just answering that question exactly in that. And I can put it in our adult terms. Like if we have a boss and one day he's like, the deadline's tomorrow. And the next day he's like, ah, never mind. You got another week. You're like, oh. and then you're like, oh, okay, good. The next time you're going to have a project, you're like, well, maybe he's going to extend that deadline. You're not going to work as hard to try to meet that deadline because you're confused at what the expectations are. Mm-hmm. The same thing for kids. It blurs the lines of what's expected of them. It also blurs the line of what's allowed and it's good and bad. And so it kind of, uh, we missed the opportunity to teach them like, the good and the bad, the, the instill the morals and the values in them if we're being confusing and inconsistent. And I think a practical way to nip that is to sit down with your spouse and get on the same page. Commit to being consistent, which means that, hey, if iPad is not the babysitter, it's not. And we're going to only stick to those 15 minutes when they're when it's needed or whatever with the timer per day. But like we're going to stick to the rules that me and my husband decide on privately without the kids because a lot of times we come into parenting uh, without having those rules established and so it's super helpful to communicate ahead of time and be on the same page with your parent with your husband or your wife Uh, another thing is our kids are not just like a, a screenshot same person every single day they mold and they change and their character changes for good and for better and so we have to pivot and we have to always adjust so me and my husband what we're doing throughout these last 12 years of parenting is every day in our debrief when we sit down and have our download like we're also talking about the kids like we're noticing certain things that are coming out of them that are flaws a lot of times it's our flaws mm-hmm. coming out in them and so we're trying to see like how can we guide our girls how can we like restrict them and give them the healthy option on to be on to develop their characters to break their wills to give them opportunities to grow to challenge them right and so that's what we have to do as parents is always analyze and watch our kids and adjust to that with our parenting styles you mentioned ipad and screen time how much of a negative effect do you see screen time whatever may be phone ipad tv having a negative effect on marriages but also on the children Yeah, so we can start with marriages and we can say that screens, let's define what screens is. It's not just the phone. It's like our TV screens, it's gaming, it's whatever is in your household. Um, And it's up to you and your spouse to kind of sit down and be like, hey, what are the screens in our house? And the second piece is like, what are they robbing us of? Or what are they doing that is putting a wedge in our relationship, in our marriage? And so one of the things is time and our attention. Like, we are in this society where we don't even know that we developed this habit. But do you ever have that habit where you like grab your phone and just check and then you go through your things like, 
I don't know what yours is. Mine's like calendar, email, like whatever, Viber or something. Because, mm-hmm. you know, at this point, I'm educated, so I don't have my notifications on. Everything's grayed out. But then I still go reach for it. I'm like, Ugh! and then it's like an every 15 minute thing, right? Mm-hmm. And so we don't even notice. But this is this is like this addiction we have to our screens. That's time consuming. And then there's this lure. The minute you check something, it like loops you in. And then the next minute, you you know, you're like watching uh, a squirrel riding on a pig YouTube videos, right? Mm -hmm. Like it takes you and we've all been there or scrolling through Instagram. And so it takes away from our time and our attention. And those two things are so valuable and indispensable when it comes to building marriages, working on marriages, putting those times into our kids. And so take your phone, look at your screen time and see like, where are you at? And I would say, wives and husbands work together. Use screen time to your advantage, like put apps on timers. Like you shouldn't be more than like what, 30, 40 minutes on certain apps before or, getting out of bed. <laughs> oh yeah. That's another one. <laughs> Sleep modes or like restricting usage that way too. Um, but it's also a trap because it's a doorway into sin. And I'm speaking to both husbands and wives. It used to be just husbands. Like this was a doorway into pornography and to just like unhealthy images, but it's now attacking both men and women. And it's so subtle because it can be as an ad on Spotify, or it can be some sort of image you see on Instagram, but this is a doorway to sin. And so we cut out all those venues as we notice them. So we always analyze as a couple, right? What are the things that are causing us to sin? Cut those out. And then the last one is specifically for wives. Like this is a tool that creeps envy and jealousy into our heart. Because as we scroll through that social media app and we start comparing and then start entertaining those thoughts, the minute you put the phone down, you view your husband in a completely different light than you did before you grabbed that phone. Mm -hmm. And so you see how it's those three little things that we just talked about are ways that are against our marriage and drain our marriage versus making it better. What are your rules when when it comes to social media? So we don't have social media. Uh, We find out from like you and people in the (laughs) church, like, oh, they're having a baby. Oh, great. It's kind of fun because we do counseling. So we know a lot about Mm -hmm. people on the other end, but we're not missing out about anything. I think we decided to uh, cancel social media when we moved back from Minnesota because we're like, okay, well, we're back here. It's not like we're going to miss out on a lot. And I'm telling you, it's been almost three and a half, four years. Didn't miss out on a thing. Like I can talk to the people I really care about and connect with them. Like, cause I really care and I have reason to ask them questions and see where they're at. I want to check in with them. That's all that matters to me. All those people I don't have interactions with. I don't need to flood my brain with extra information about them that can cause me to be envious or jealous. But the rules we have is we have no phone zones in our house where like, Hey, in the bedroom, we shouldn't have our phones. Sergi's so good about that and catching me. And sometimes I'll be like responding to counseling text messages or something like, Hey, we're in the no phone zone in the bedroom, like put it away. And then another rule we have is no phones in the morning when you wake up until you touch the word of God and have your devotional time and just like wake up and then one hour before bedtime. And that's for like physical reasons too. I'm sure your wife in the medical field can acknowledge to that. Like the light that we see from the phone screens can stimulate and actually wake us up and not help us fall asleep. And then we don't have good sleep patterns, which is a ripple effect into a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, You guys are a great example when it comes to, because I think for myself, I'm way too, <clears throat> spend way too much time on social media. And then I'm thinking like, I'm going to miss out on every little detail. And then you guys are heavily involved in church and with a lot of different people. And you guys are just as aware of world events and news and people's lives as anybody else. Before we move on to the last part of establishing counseling ministry at church, what would your word of encouragement be for a mom that may be discouraged, tired, hopeless, that she's not doing a great job, mom guilt is over the top, What can she do to find her footing and foundation again? Yeah, I just want to say, hey, tired mom, you're doing one of the most powerful, most important jobs out there. Greater than any lead pastor of any church, mega church, greater than any like government official or CEO of a company. Like you have in your hands the ability to mold a soul and shift their face towards pursuing Christ. What an incredible and heavy opportunity and weight that is and responsibility. And for that reason, Satan is attacking and is after the mothers who are mothering hard to shape these young little souls, these little disciples as we are disciple makers, right? And so Satan's going to do that through lies. He's going to do that through kind of 
lusts or temptations because when we're tired and when we're suffering, that's when we, Satan creeps in and it's so much easier to fall into all these sins and lusts and stuff. So I would say, check and examine, like, where are you at? Are there little sins that are slowly starting to creep in because you've at the, you're at the point where you've drained and poured out so much that you don't care anymore to fight for yourself and start seeking help outside of yourself. Find opportunities for yourself to meet with a biblical counselor, a dear friend or a mentor to kind of help you examine those and get you back on the right path. But also examine what other things creep in. Like we talked about social media, like talk about comparing other moms who have their perfect clean houses and have their kids signed up for private school and warm, happy cooked meals on the table. And everybody's around the table like those things are death to a tired mom who has barely enough time to like, you know, remove the gum from the floor or like shove the dishes that are a mountain into the dishwasher. Um, So in those cases, what are you immersing yourself in? Like if you are a tired mom, I know you're exposing and taking in a lot of stuff that could be in a negative. And so I would say just go cold turkey and shut it all out. And if you just want to take this challenge from me and for the next week or two, just immerse yourself in scripture. That is the power, both physically, both discerning and wisdom for parenting, both for you to have hope to keep going. Like go into the scriptures. I challenge you to wake up early. Take that shower and spend that time, that quiet time or during the naps or whenever you have in the evening, find your attention span time, your power block, and just dive into the scripture and go into the book of James and study it for this week, all five chapters and see what you take out of it while you're eliminating social media, while you're eliminating any other sources of comparison, and also while you're examining kind of like what other sins you're dealing with in your own life. And I think that our tired moms are the ones who should be focused on in the churches, supported by the churches. And the church should come around them and kind of like lift them up to a higher pedestal of what their role is. A lot of times it's frowned upon in our culture, in our society, right? The stay-at-home mom with the toddlers. And our church, Living Hope, is actually focusing with growth groups for moms. Mom Set Free, we did last summer, where we have an opportunity for moms to bring in their babies, bring in their toddlers, We have people to take care of them in the nursery um, that are trustworthy adults and they have time to just sit there. Like we'll serve them coffee and pastries and they can just like share each other's burdens, normalize, examine, kind of be encouraged to correct certain things or be affirmed that they're not the only crazy ones doing certain things. Right. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, dive into scripture because that's the source of energy for these tired moms. What can husbands do to help and assist their tired and exhausted moms? That's a great question. And I want to give a shout out to all the husbands. I think you're included in that one. (laughs) Uh, Of the wives who attend Wifeline, our Wifeline, this growth group that we have, meets on Sundays at 9 a.m. These awesome moms leave their little babies with the dads, and the dads are okay with it. They're not giving the wives a hard time. They're just like, hey, this is your time to invest into yourself spiritually because I know it's going to give me back. When you become, when you come home and you're peaceful and you're spirit-filled and you're loving and sacrificial, like all those things. So it's giving back to these husbands. But the greatest thing a husband can do is provide an opportunity within a week, in that week, like an hour or two, and encourage the wife to just go and be filled spiritually. Whether it's like, hey, Honey, go into prayer room and this is just your time. Like, or you guys can both go together. We have nursery for that. Or encourage them to join a Bible study or some sort of growth group, like a place where your wife can be poured into spiritually. You'll see huge benefit and effect on the family as your wife's receiving this place of pouring into and coming back full. She can function out of a different place Mm -hmm. as she loves on you and the kids. I enjoy the the fruit of wife line in in a ghost to that. So I enjoy Throughout the week, she'll mention, oh, we talked about a wife line about this. So I'm trying to do this. And we experience the blessing of her trying to grow spiritually, but she's growing spiritually herself. Yeah. She's focused on us, on, yeah. on me, on, on the kids and how to serve us yeah. better and how to be a better wife. So thank, thank yeah, you well, for Yeah, well, I want to give a shout out to you guys. Like you have little kids. Esther's not walking and Sierra's a toddler still technically, mm-hmm. a young little one. But Ina is at every prayer room. She's at every gathering. She's involved in all of our women's ministries. She doesn't skip an opportunity to be poured into. I've seen her at Bible studies. I've seen her in growth groups. She's serving. And you can see that. Like, she has the energy to go and pour out into you and the kids. And then you guys are always, like, making it to things. It's so awesome. It's a testimony of the fact that this is works, what, what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Like, if you take set aside the time and sacrifice to be poured into, you'll have higher energy levels to pour out into your family. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The shout, shout out to Ina. She's juggling a lot of uh, different things and 
she's able to all of, to do all of this. But as a family, what benefited us or what helped us to do this is we kind of decided what is a priority in our life. Exactly. So when it comes to <clears throat> our family and then ministry is a high priority in our life mm-hmm. and the church and the life of the church. So if there's a, a birthday pa- party happening, a family gathering happening, events are happening, but if there's a church event, we kind of made a decision that we say, hey, we're going to be two hours late. Oh, we won't be able to make it because we have a church thing happening. And I love that. And I'm glad to say that nobody's life fell apart yeah. because we didn't make it to a birthday party or we right. engagement party or whatever. There's always, especially as having a big family, there's always a gathering. And yeah. so that helped to make a talk about and set those priorities. Mm-hmm. And it's like, hey, no, we'll, we'll come to the family gathering. We'll just be two hours late. Yeah. So you guys yeah. go ahead. Yeah. And you will notice that nobody really cares exactly. if, you're not, if you're not there. Yeah, And that's a challenge to those listening. Give it a try. Like the fact that you miss out or come later, but you prioritize mm-hmm. the kingdom of God and being poured into spiritually, like what a benefit you're going to have. And in fact, it's going to grow and enhance those other relationships that you would have thought that you missed out on. But what it took from you guys is communication to identify those priorities, right? Determine what's the non-negotiables. Like me and my family in our mission statement, we're going to go and make sure we put priorities on ministry, show up to prayer room, lead growth groups or whatever else, right? That had to be communicated and established and written down. So I encourage families listening today, like make a mission statement, hang it up somewhere in your fridge and kind of go back to it and analyze it. Like, are you derailing from it or are you still following strong on that? Like, are you kind of forgetting the non-negotiables? Are you still showing up to prayer room or to life group or whatever it is that you do? But make that vision statement, mission statement, stick to it. Thank you for sharing so much when it comes to marriage, parenting, from your life experiences, counseling experience. But before we move on, what advice on or encouragement do you have for families? Because we talked about marriage and parenting a lot for parents. And now it seems like it's more common than before. I don't know if it was just younger, that didn't care as much, that wasn't aware as much for families that are struggling having children. Because that could be a very tiring and maybe a hopeless place. Have you encountered something like this in your counseling experience? And what advice and counsel do you have for those families? Yeah. I think it's prominent nowadays for a few reasons but some of them could be like it's actually coming to light people are being more vocal about it versus before the culture was to like hush hush and not talk about it and just deal with it internally and there's trauma i'm sure coming out of that um another thing is like the world we live in and the things we put in our body diet nutrition wise and things we expose ourselves to in this world they kind of harm our bodies as women right Mm -hmm. and harm our reproductive or impact the reproductive organs and all that um but also like our means of birth control I want to go there and I want to highlight like some of these means of how we do birth control in the beginning stages of our newlywed life. Like they can have uh, adverse effects on when we do decide to have children and they can impact in a negative way, too. So that's something to talk about with your uh, leaders in the church or your biblical counselors. Um, We do that often. We talk about that in premarital Mm -hmm. and then we talk about that with couples, too. But I think that the first thing is exactly what we touched on in the beginning is the key to working through infertility and struggles with miscarriages is to bring it to light because the heaviest burden to carry is the burden you carry alone. The minute you start sharing with someone, a little ounce of that burden is now left with that person. And hey, if they're a believer, they're going to carry you in prayer and be a spiritual warrior for you and check in on you. It's that much easier to lighten the burden, right? And the second part is if this continues and it becomes kind of like a cycle or it's a suffering journey, we tend to kind of lose hope or we tend to get bitter. And so in those moments, it's so good to engage a biblical counselor or a leader or a marriage mentor in your church to help you work through those things, to help you regain the hope, right? Um, a lot of times, just like with the stress, like we're stressing so much about it that that affects our physical body. The same way we're going through all these disappointments that that starts to affect our spiritual walk with Christ. And it's so important to have someone from the outside come in and encourage you and pray with you. And also just encourage your faith to like speak it out in Jesus name and proclaim fertility over yourself and also help you zoom out and see the big perspective, right? Of what God is doing in your life and for what reasons. We have couples in our church that struggle with miscarriages, that struggle with infertility. We come around them. So biblical counseling at Living Hope Church is comprised not just of like the biblical counseling sessions that we have, but we also have something called care team. 
where we have people in our church, which is a team that is dispatched every time someone's going through something. And we do acts of kindness, gifts of kindness. We come around them. The counselors text them and encourage them and walk through them and prayer through the hard moments. But it's become this culture at Living Hope Church where it's like, it's no longer a shame if you're struggling or something happened to you or if you're dealing with a miscarriage. Like you reach out to your life group leaders, which is like a small group gathering every week that we have. And then from there, those life group leaders would reach out to the care team, to Hope Link, and we would engage and we would encourage and all of a sudden we're doing this as a village and it's that much lighter and easier and so there's power in that thank you for that and then multiple times throughout the conversation you mentioned you know go talk to your biblical counselor and this is what we do at living hope and shout out to hope link and biblical biblical counseling department at living hope church for doing this establishing this and being a huge blessing for the people and one of the things that i like is the how the whole counseling idea is becoming more and more normalized. Like you said, like the, it's not being do- done in like secret. Mm-hmm. And and even recently before prayer room, I was hanging out and one of the think, husband and wife was there. I was like, Oh, what are you guys doing here for the prayer room? It's like, and they were like, Oh no, just we're here to meet with Katie. And I'm like, that's so cool that they don't have to like hide and do yeah. it in secret. And it's like, it became more normalize where it's yeah. like oh yeah it's normal to go and meet with katie with sergi mm-hmm. and talk to them and get some help and get some advice yeah. so thank you guys for spearheading that and being passionate about that but somebody that is listening may not have this at their church and maybe it's on their it's on their heart it's their passion as it was on your heart to set this up in their church what are first initial steps and resources they can reach out to find to get started with set, setting up biblical counseling at their church at their church yeah i think the first thing is to just recognize that this is a need that's not a hard one that's not rocket science i think every church can say like hey this is an actual need pastors alone cannot carry the load of preparing however 20 hours a week for a sermon that's going to edify and build up and correct the congregation and also yielding all the calls and all the cases where they have to be dispatched because someone's, you know, had an accident or a miscarriage or something. And also meeting with all the people and counseling is not a one time thing. I mean, our counseling lasts anywhere from like four weeks to about three months. So you you're committed. And in between the sessions, you're praying for them, you're checking in on them. So it's a big burden on pastors, I would say. And so starting off with the fact that like, yes, this is a need in our church, and we're willing to invest into it. And then it starts at the top, it starts with the leadership with the pastoral team. And I love our pastoral team. They're so passionate about biblical counseling being elevated and being promoted. And not only that, like the initiative between all of our leadership at Living Hope Church is to promote a culture where it's okay to receive counseling. We all need biblical counsel, right? And we can all counsel each other. But then when it gets intensive and uh, the cases get harder, we go to a biblical counselor that's equipped. And that person is can be committed to you, can check in on you, can take on that heavier portion of that accountability. But our church culture knows it's not embarrassing. In fact, it's actually looked as a high kind of accomplishment because you're doing preventative care. You're working on your marriage. You're avoiding other mistakes you could be making. So that's number one. And then I mentioned like church leadership endorsed. Any counseling ministry should, first of all, be church based. Like we all agree on that. And we talked about that a tiny bit, but as you're receiving counseling, for example, before you like graduate, we want to make sure you're plugged into a life group. So there's always someone keeping a pulse on you once you graduate. We also want to make sure you're part of a ministry because when you're showing up and you're serving, you're in full alignment of the best version of what God wants you to be. And all of that happens within the church. If counseling is separate, then you don't know after that counselee is graduated, what environment they're going back to and what triggers and what kind of negative draining things they're going to face that person. And so it's like work undone almost. Mm -hmm. So church based. And then it has to be approved by the pastoral team. Like they have to endorse it. They have to preach it from the pulpit. Right. And then this, the, the, so those are the basic foundational things. Mm -hmm. And then once you identify that need and you establish a counseling ministry in your church, now you're looking for people. And the very first and foremost thing I always say is like, it's always exciting at first. Everybody wants to be a biblical counselor. Who doesn't want to give advice, right? Mm -hmm. But this has to be individuals who have a deep, deep burden for broken people. Because guess what? Counseling is hard. Broken people are spiky, pokey. They're unpleasant. They hurt you along the way, but you have to be committed and you have to see past that person's sin and love on that person and their brokenness because you know that there's something greater happening there. 
And so a lot of people jump on board. Don't be discouraged as you're starting your biblical counseling. If some of them fall off, those ones who have a true burden will stick through it. And then these counselors, they have to be equipped. And that's the part that we focus on at HopeLink is we want to make sure our counselors are equipped both in the word of God. So theologically, and also with like counseling tools, because it's so nice to have that background and to be able to read a person and apply those tools and skills as you preach the word and make it central in your sessions. And so what we do is a couple different things. There's a certification process we go through uh, through an organization called ACBC. So it's an Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, ACBC. And you guys can Google it and check it out. But they provide kind of like a on your own study uh, certification that's three phases. So the first phase would be like watch all these videos with that teach you on the counseling technique and then read all these books. I think it's like a thousand pages. Mm -hmm. 300 of them are theology. And then the second phase is the phase I'm in currently. And that's the phase where you have to do 50 questions, 25 questions, theological exam, 25 questions, counseling exam, and you submit that to their board. You They review it. If you know, if they want you to update it, they'll send you edits. And then the last phase is the phase where you have, I think it's 50 hours of counseling practice. Mm -hmm. And so with like a mentor, you check in with one of their ACBC mentors. So by the time you're done, the reason why I'm laying that out is to show you like, this is a really well-known nationwide organization that really prepares biblical counselors. And they're very much conservative biblical counselors. Another thing HopeLink accepts as part of our team is people who have been certified outside of this. So for example, I went to Liberty and I got my degree in biblical counseling. I specialize in marriage and family. We have someone else that's going to soon join the team and she's doing, I think, women's counseling. And she's also getting her bachelor's degree through that. Mm -hmm. So having your counselors be equipped and have the tools and also like encouraging ongoing things. So right now um, there's a conference that's happening up North uh, Canyon Hills church is hosting it. It's called, I think Pacific Northwest biblical counseling conference. We're going to it. I think it's May mm -hmm. 3rd through the 5th. Uh, engage yourself in that. Like if you're interested as a church to start something out, sign up for that. It's right here up North. Just talk to the people, uh, network with other churches. You'll be amazed. Like when we started networking, how open churches are, they're willing to share resources, willing to share their forms, have you sit in on some sessions and just like, we're all after the same goal. And that's to win more souls for Christ. And so sometimes we're like, Oh, this is mine. And that's yours. Like, let's get together and, and just do that. And so that's, if, if I could encourage anyone, those would be the steps to take. Yeah. And to add to that, Counseling, biblical counseling at a church is a huge blessing. And for those that are listening, a word of encouragement is that you don't just come to a pastor and say, establish biblical counseling. We need it. Look, other churches have it. Why don't you have one at our church? But the route, for example, you took, you didn't put it on Alex. Like, Alex, why don't you set up biblical counseling? We need it. You went to Liberty. You, you got your degree. You're going through ACBC, getting that certification and I think anybody that goes through the training and preparation process and any pastor would love to have that resource resource in their church. Yeah. So whoever you may be, if you come to the pastor, say, hey, here's a degree that I'm going through. Here's a certification I'm getting. Here's the training that I'm going through. Mm -hmm. I want to serve the church. I want to serve the members of the church. How can we do it? And I think you could be anybody could be a huge blessing to the people of yeah. their church. And yeah, I guess the emphasis is that don't just put it on your pastor to do it. Mm -hmm. If it's a burden on your heart. Absolutely. Uh, and to some degree, we're all counselors. Yeah. If we put the Bible and scripture as primary in all of our advice and what we talk about, like we sit over coffee and we encourage a sister in Christ through a passage, like that's counseling right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the reason why it separates and it becomes a ministry is because we take on more advanced cases. Mm -hmm. But to your listeners that are listening right now, and maybe you don't have in your church a biblical counseling ministry, like take this challenge from me. It's just a simple challenge. Remove social media and any other triggers that are worldly triggers and influences. And you know what I'm talking about. Like, it's not rocket science. If you examine your day, the things that impact you negatively, remove those for two weeks. Okay. And then for the next two weeks, commit to early rising. So as a wife, get up earlier. I know it's going to squeeze you and you're going to have to give a little bit, but man, God sees that in your heart and he sees that desire and hunger for his word and for knowing him and just go through like the book of Ephesians or the book of James, like a couple passages in the, in your morning, spend no more than 15, 20 minutes and just prayerfully meditate on it throughout the day. Bring it back to your mind throughout the day as you go through and apply it to your life. And you'll see a huge difference in how you just like 
perceive the day and how you react to things with more self-control that the Spirit's going to enable you to do. And then seek out in your church a Bible study or create one with your friends. Like, hey, have your girlfriends come over on like a Friday night and just go through these studies as you read throughout the week. Discuss it on that evening and it'll be a huge benefit for you. You'll see that for sure. Katie, thank you for sacrificing this time this evening to share your experiences and your uh, lessons when it comes to anything, marriage, parenting, and everything in between. If somebody's listening and they want to reach out to you for more questions, their their family stuff or Mm -hmm. about biblical counseling, I'm thinking maybe not a phone number to plaster all over internet. (laughs) I'm thinking maybe like an email so somebody can reach out more formally. So then you're not expected to like respond right away. So probably that'd be a better way if you're fine with yeah. sharing an email. Sure. So the greatest way to get a hold of me is to come visit Living Hope Church. If you don't belong to a church family <laughs> and you've never attended church for a while, or maybe you're going to a church and you're not being fed spiritually or it's in a different language or something, like come to Living Hope Church. It's in Kent. It's Calvary Chapel South, right? It mm-hmm. meets at two o'clock or you can Google Living Hope Church and W and um, you can see our meeting time. So we meet every Sunday at 2 p.m. I'm always there in the lobby, either before or after, and I'm more than happy to chat with anyone who's visiting our church. And also, you can reach out to me, um, hopelink at Mm. livinghopenw.com. That's our email, hopelink at livinghopenw.com. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, for your time. Thank you for what you do. I know that you're impacting a lot of lives, encouraging them, motivating them to be better, to strive to be more Christ-like. So. I I love it. And I don't think people tell you enough, but you're making a huge impact in our culture, in our society, in our community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 